Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem constrained subsequence sum. We're given an integer array of nums and an integer k. We want to return the maximum sum of a non-empty subsequence, but there is a bit of a restriction here. So take a look at this array. And in this example, k is equal to 2. So what that means is we want a subsequence and typically with subsequences, we can say, okay, we can include this element or we can skip this element and we can do that for every single element. So we might end up like, let's say choosing this and we could skip an arbitrary number of elements. We could have a gap that is arbitrarily large, but in this problem, our gap is actually limited by K. So it's a little bit uh, unintuitive. So if K is two, that doesn't mean that the max gap can be equal to two. It means that the maximum distance between elements that we include can be two. So if K is equal to two, we can skip at most one consecutive element. So typically with subsequence problems, it's pretty common to solve these with dynamic programming. And that's definitely the case with this problem. It's possible to solve it with dynamic programming. And I'll actually show you the dynamic programming solution, but you're going to notice we do get time limit exceeded. And the hint that you would get time limit exceeded is that the dynamic programming solution for this problem is actually very, very easy. It's pretty common with subsequence problems. Like for example, in the longest increasing subsequence problem, and I would recommend uh, checking that problem out if you struggle with this one, it's somewhat similar, not like exactly the same, but the idea is that for every position, the sub problem is what would be the result of this problem? Like what would be the maximum sum that we can get with this array? And what would be the maximum that we can get with this subarray and this subarray and this subarray, et cetera, et cetera. So these are kind of our sub problems, but it's actually not just that simple. There's one more catch to the sub problem. For example, for this sub problem, we're not just computing the maximum sum, but we're specifically computing the maximum sum that includes the last element in this subarray. And we're doing that very, very deliberately. With the longest increasing subsequence problem, we do that because we want to know, like, if we're computing this sub problem, we want to ensure that the elements that we're including are in increasing order. And we want the last element of like the previous sub problem. And we want to be able to ensure that these are in increasing order. That's for the LIS problem. But for this problem, it's a little bit different. Why do you think we would want to know that for sure this element exists in the subsequence. For example, by the time we get here, by the time we're trying to compute the subproblem for this value and this subarray, why would we want to know what the solution would be for this subproblem, this subproblem, and this subproblem, where all of those actually include the last integer? Because we want to know, and I'm actually just going to start uh, computing it really quickly. We're going to call it DP. What would be the max sum ending here where we must include this element? It would be 10. What would be the max ending here where we include uh, this element? It would be 12 because we're definitely including this and we have a choice whether we want to include this or not. So we, of course, are going to. Now, when we get here, we have a negative 10. We have to include the negative 10. And now we have a choice to make, actually. We can look at the two previous values in the DP array. The reason we can look at these two is because we know if we look at this value 12, we know for sure we included this value, so the gap would be sufficiently small. And if we look at the 10, we know for sure we included this, and this gap is also sufficiently small. So what we do with these two values is compare them, which one is greater, 12. So we're going to take 12 and add it to negative 10. We're going to get a 2 over here. So this is basically how we solve the problem. For the 5, we're going to do the same thing. We have to include the 5, but which one of these two are we going to include? Probably the 12. So then we get 17 over here. And then lastly, we get 20. We have to include it. We look at the two previous values. And we don't, by the way, have to include these two. Because if we chose, I'm going to skip this and I'm going to skip this. That would mean we skipped everything except we included the 20. And that's perfectly valid because it guarantees that our subsequence is non-empty. 
And it also ensures that the gap is small because yes, we can have one element and we can start anywhere in the array. Like this does not count as a gap because the gap only exists between two elements that we've actually chosen. So here uh, with this 20, we choose the maximum of these two. If they were both negative, that would be the case where we don't include either of them, but they're not negative. So we include the 17, we get a 37 in the last spot. And then for all of these, we're just going to take the maximum of them and then return that. And we got 37. And that is the solution to this problem. Now, the only downside with this solution, like I said, like this is the solution. This works to solve this problem, but it's almost too easy. And that's why it gets time limit exceeded. The overall time complexity here is going to be big O of N, where N is the size of the input array. But notice for every element, we might have to look at the K previous values in our DP array. So the time complexity becomes big O of N times K. Space complexity for the DP array is gonna be big O of N, though we could optimize it to big O of K if we really wanted to, because you notice that we only need the K previous elements in the array. But I'm not even gonna make that optimization because this won't pass anyway. I just wanna quickly show it to you. So I'm going to create that DP array that I was talking about. We're gonna initialize it with all zeros for now, but the length is gonna be the length of the input array nums. And we already know that the first value is pretty straightforward. It's just gonna be the first value in the array. So I'm just gonna initialize that. And then when I start my loop, I'm gonna start at index one rather than index zero. And at this point, it becomes pretty straightforward. We're going to just have a loop. I'm going to use index J. We're going to go over the K previous values, which would be from I minus K all the way up until, but not necessarily including I. And this might end up being negative. So if we want to, we can say max of zero and I minus K so that we don't ever get anything less than zero. And uh, at this point, it's pretty much computing the maximum. So for DP of I, we want to compute what's the max possible sum that we can get here. And we do that by either uh, setting it to itself or setting it to the current number plus DP of J. We're looking at the K previous uh, sub problem results and considering adding them to the current number. Now there's one last catch. Notice that this actually doesn't include the possibility that we might just want DP of I to be nums of I itself, meaning we don't include any previous sub problem. So to handle that case, I'm going to initialize DP of I with nums of I. And if we wanted to actually uh, get rid of this, we could instead initialize our DP array like this N for n in uh, nums. And that will pretty much do the same thing. I think this is slightly less readable, but uh, you can kind of choose uh, what you'd like. But at this point, we've solved the problem. At this point, we just have to return max of dp. Now, you can see, though, after running the code, we do get time limit exceeded on one of the large inputs. And that's because if we look at the left, we find that k can potentially be the same size as the length of the input array. So k might not be very small. And you can see in this example, k is very, very big. That means our solution is not super efficient. Let's try to optimize it. So this solution, the one that we coded up, is actually not too far away from a more optimized solution. It's kind of reminiscent of like the sliding window solution. Like we want to keep a window of max size K as we iterate. So like at this point, we'd, we might want like a window of the K previous elements. And that's kind of what we're doing with these values. But even if we do that, like even if we implement the sliding window, for us to go through the values in that window and find the maximum of them, that's the inefficient part. That's the part that is taking us big O of K time. Can we do that any more efficiently? Well, possibly with a heap, like if these values are within a heap, probably a max heap more specifically, we can then theoretically pop it in log K time. So how can we try to use a heap to more efficiently solve the problem? Because at first, to be honest, it seems like a heap won't work. And let me tell you why 
initially you might think it's not going to work because let's say we get to this point, like let's say we're at five and we have these two elements in our heap, 12 and two. We want to get the maximum of them. That's pretty easy to do. We just get 12, right? That's going to be the maximum. That's kind of what the max heap is for. So we do that very efficiently. We do that very easily. Now it's time for us to shift to the right. We're at 20. And maybe when we were at five, we also included this 17 adding to a heap is pretty easy. OK, now it's our turn to remove from the heap, just like the sliding window, right? We want to remove this leftmost element just like it's a sliding window problem. Well, that's not what a heap is for. Remember, when we remove from heaps, we can remove the max element. And in this case, it actually looks like it works. When we remove the max, we remove the leftmost element. OK, but now when we try to do it again, now when we're at 20, OK, we include, let's say, the, the 37. And now we're trying to pop this leftmost element from the heap. Well, since this is a max heap, it's going to end up popping the 37. But what we actually want to do is pop based on the index. And we can't do that for us to remove by an index. If the max heap is sorted by these values, we can't do that. That's going to be inefficient. But my proposal to you, and this is kind of the hard part of this problem. This is why it's a hard that it actually is possible for us to solve this problem. And we don't necessarily have to remove the leftmost element. And let me show you why. Let me kind of dry run through this. I'm going to leave these values here so that we don't have to recompute them, but assume that that's kind of what we're doing. That's what we're doing to solve this problem right now. So we start at 10. We already know that the max result for that is going to be 10. OK, then we get to two. And this is now a part of our max heap. When we add this to the heap, not only do we add 10, but we add the index zero that this ended at. So keep that in mind. We're also adding the index for all of these into our max heap. Now, when we're at two, we can take that 10 and add it to two. And then we're going to get 12 here. So now we'll have another one in our heap. We'll have 12 and one. And we don't have to remove yet because the gap is not large enough. We have K equals two. We have not exceeded that in our heap. So then we get to negative 10 over here. And once again, we're going to get the max from our heap and we don't have to pop from the heap to get the max. We get 12, 12 plus negative 10 is going to be two. So now we add two to the max heap. So we have two and uh, index two is the second value. But now when it comes for five, for us to compute the value that goes here, we cannot consider all three of these. But that actually doesn't necessarily mean that we have to remove the 10 immediately, because what we're going to do is only consider of all of these. We're going to first find what's the max value right now. It happens to be 12. OK, and we're going to try to add 12 and five together. But before we can do that, we have to ensure that the index that this 12 was ending at the differential between that index and the index that we're currently at is less than or equal to two. And right now that does happen to be the case. So there's nothing for us to do. There's no problem here. Just because we have multiple values in the heap doesn't mean we're necessarily using the ones that are out of bounds. And if we were using the ones that are out of bounds, we would try to pop that first. So Right now, we're able to do things. We're able to compute the 17 and add it to the heap. Now the values in our heap are going to be uh, 17 and the index was three. Now, by the time we get to 20, we're kind of going to do the exact same thing. We're going to try to get the max from the heap. It's going to be 17. We're going to find that the index was three. The index here is four. So the differential is small enough. And then we're going to end up computing the 37. But what if it wasn't like what if hypothetically this was a seven and we instead got these two values from the max heap? Well, we're trying to compute 20 plus whatever the max we can get from the max heap is. We find that it's 12 initially. Now, this differential is definitely too large. 12 was at index one. We're currently, I think, at index four. So this differential is too large. What are we going to do? This would not be valid. 12 plus 20 would not be valid. So what we actually do is pop this guy from our heap. It's kind of a greedy algorithm at this point. Now we try the same thing again. We try to get the max from the heap. We find that it's 10. Once again, this gap is too large. So we pop 
10 from the heap as well. So these two are out of the heap. And then we'd only be left with uh, these two values. And then we would find that this one is the next largest and it happens to be close enough. So we would take that and add it here. So that's kind of the intuition of solving this with a max heap. Now you might notice that the downside is that the heap is not necessarily going to be limited to a size of K. It could actually be as long as the input array itself. So the overall time complexity is going to be N because we're iterating over the array and we might end up pushing and popping every single value to the heap. So that's going to be log N and that's the overall time complexity for this solution. And a memory complexity is also big of N because that could be the max size of our heap. So now let's code up this more optimized solution. Okay, so now let's code this up. And one thing I didn't mention previously is that we actually don't need to compute the entire DP array because remember, we're just using the heap to have those elements anyway. So that's uh, why I'm just gonna maintain a single variable for the result. And we're gonna initialize it kind of the same way. It's gonna be the first value. Since once again, we're gonna have our loop for I in range starting at index one, we're going to initialize the heap similarly to the way we did the DP array previously we're just going to have the max heap initialized with the first value nums at index zero and the second value in this pair is going to be the index which is a zero so I'll make a quick comment here so this is going to be the first value is going to be the max sum and it's going to be ending at this particular index and one thing to mention though is python actually doesn't have max heaps this is going to be a min heap by default and for us to get around that we can just make the key in this case be negative so we're going to be pushing and popping based on what this value happens to be and we'll have to keep in mind that we've made it negative so if we want the original value we'll have to add another negative after we pop it okay now what we would normally do is compute the current sum the current max sum and ending at index i kind of the same way that we did before we're going to take the max of the number itself at this index or the number itself added with the value that we get from the max heap which we would get like this max heap at index zero that's going to give us the top of the heap and of the top of the heap we want the first value which was the actual max sum so once again we say index zero and remember we made this negative so if we want the true value here we have to add another negative sign so instead of making this a plus i'm going to make it a negative so what this is doing is it's saying we're taking the current value plus the max sum that we could have possibly computed anywhere in the max heap and adding them together. And we might not even use this value in our result, like we also consider this possibility as well. But you might see the problem here. We don't necessarily wanna pop anything from the max heap. We only wanna get the value if the index is within the range of K. So before we even do this, we have to ensure that the index actually is in range. How do we do that? Well, we have to make sure that I, the current index minus the index at the top of the heap, which is uh, at index zero. And for us to get the index this time, we, we, which is the uh, second value in that pair, we do one. So this is the top of the heap. This is what we would be adding here, but we only want to do this if it's in bounds. If this is less than or actually in this case, if this is a greater than K, because we know this is always gonna be positive because I is always gonna be greater than the previous indices. So if this is the case, what we wanna do is say heap Q dot heap pop from the max heap. And we can't just make this an if statement. You might be thinking with like a typical sliding window, we probably only are gonna shift by one as we iterate through the input array. But remember, for reasons I talked about earlier, because the heap could be arbitrarily large, we actually need this to be a while loop. So this way, after the while loop is done, we know for sure that the top of the heap will be close enough to the current index. And we also actually guarantee that the heap won't be empty either because for any index i, i minus one will be within the heap. The index i minus one, the previous index will be in the heap and that's always gonna be considered valid. And that's because k is always gonna be greater than or equal to one. So that's why we can kind of get away with that. 
Now, after you've done this, you've more or less solved the problem. So at this point, we would want to maximize our result. So the result might be itself or it might be the current max that we ended up computing. And lastly, before we go to the next iteration of the loop, let's also push this to our heap. So we're going to say heap q.heap push to the max heap, this pair of values, which is the current max. But remember, every time we add it to the heap, we kind of have to make it negative because uh, we're simulating this uh, using like a minimum heap uh, under the hood. And the second is going to be, of course, the index of this current maximum that we're currently at. So that's the solution. All we have to do now is return the result. That's the entire code. Let's run it to make sure that it works. As you can see on the left, yes, it does. And it's relatively efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.